Today's episode is brought to you by MetaMask Portfolio. You'll be hearing more about them later on, but for now, let's get into today's interview. Very happy to welcome back to Forward Guidance, Warren Pies, founder of 314 Research. Warren, welcome back, man. It's been too long. Absolutely. It's uh, it's great to be back here. I think, um, I don't know if the last time I was here, but I know I was one of your first guests, and so it's been great to watch your show flourish. Thank you so much. Warren, for a very long time now, you've been overweight commodities and underweight bonds, and you have defied the somewhat consensus call that there would be a recession. Needless to say, these three calls uh, have aged very well. We have not had a recession. Bonds have crashed more than even the biggest bond bears expected. And commodities uh, uh, have, have done well, especially last year. But it's my understanding that you've now changed your asset allocation and you're changing your macro view and I want to know why. And I, I first should say for the audience that you are a very quantitative analyst with a background in oil, but now you do uh, all things in, in macro and you've been doing a lot of work on, on the labor market. So why are you changing your, your view now? What's going on? Just to, to be put a real fine point on it. Coming into the second half of the year, we were significantly underweight bonds. We uh, Cash was actually our biggest position. The commodities was was the largest amongst assets. And then stocks fell in between those two. And so I really think that the biggest change has been just price. You know, it's, there are no bad assets, only bad prices is kind of a, a, a saying that we go by. Uh, bonds enter the, the second half, um, really, but what was the 10 year at like 3.8 or something like that? We had a negative term premium and here we are at roughly 5% on the 10 year. Uh, from multiple valuation angles, we thought bonds were overvalued back then, and they've become more or less, I'd say, fairly valued at this stage of the game. It doesn't mean that yields can't go higher or won't go higher. I, I kind of doubt that we've seen the absolute high in, in long bond yields and the 10-year yield, but there is certainly value that's emerged here um, on the 10-year. And then if you look at on the commodity side, Oil was about $70, $75 entering the second half of the year. We had a record, multi-year record hedge fund short positioning within the, the crude oil market, which is really a key indicator for us. At the same time, Saudis were holding so much oil back from the market and basically forcing deficits through the summer. And so our view is that the Saudis were going to force these, these speculators to cover their short positions, drive the price up. We thought our analysis said we'd be at about $100 a barrel was our target for the second half of the year. We basically got to 98 on dated Brent, which is our benchmark. And we flipped our, we first started dialing down our commodity exposure and putting, increasing our bond exposure um, September 21st. And so that was when the 10 year was about 4.5. And then we increased bond exposure again at 4.8 and then again at 5%. And I'm talking about the 10 year here. In each one of those cases and so we are now coming into q4 we are now officially overweight bonds uh with the move of at the five once we had five percent last week we went overweight and underweight commodities underweight stocks overweight slightly overweight cash and that's the that's basically our position looking ahead our, our basic thesis is that the risk reward for if you're going to have a Q4 rally or even beyond that, really favors bonds over stocks, you know, because I think there's this idea that seasonality is starting to line up for a stock rally. And I think that it all points back to rates. I don't think we get a stock rally here unless rates come down, bonds rally. And I, and I think that the risk reward favors bonds because of that. Thanks. And tell us about how your outlook on bonds and the sensitivity to, to interest rates impact stocks? Because if, if bond yields go up, by definition, bonds will have sold off in price. If bond yields go down, by definition, bond yields will have, have rallied. But how does that impact the stock market? You know, you, you've chronicled, uh, Warren, since uh, the late 90s, how bonds have served as a hedge against stocks. If you're a hedge fund manager, if you're long stocks, you buy a, a ton of duration so that when stocks crash, bonds are going to rally. You accurately predicted that that would not happen. And last year was a historic route where the stock market sold off significantly and the bond market crashed alongside it. And interestingly, on an intraday basis or a, you know, a one, one day basis, five day basis, that has continued this year. So, so tell us, do you expect bonds to continue to be a, a bad hedge for stocks? And if so, and bond yields continue to go up, is, is that sort of the primary threat to stocks? 
yields have been the, the proximate cause of the sell-off. And we can kind of see that. I think market structure really reveals that. And so when I look back, if you think about it, this, we, the market stock market peaked on July 31st. That was the date the Treasury came out with their QRA and announced how they were going to fund the deficit in the, in the government in Q3 and then projected for Q4. That's when yield started to break out above 4%. And once we got above 4% on the 10 year, that's when you started seeing the equity market really have a hard time digesting that. And ultimately, stocks and bonds are competing for investment dollars. And when stock, when, when the risk free rate goes up, stocks look relatively less attractive. And so I, I, I can see that really in the breadth. And so this is where we've started to really zero in because you have this market structure everyone's kind of familiar with now where the top seven mega cap tech stocks are doing one thing and the rest of the market is doing another. And really from that second half of the year, July 31st date, there's been a very strong correlation between the rise in yields and the fall in breadth. You also can see the rise in yields correlating with the fall in the Russell 2000. Russell 2000 obviously is stripped of all of that mega cap kind of um, exposure. So yeah, QRA quarterly refunding announcement, how much duration the treasury is going to put into the market to fund itself. And then when you say breadth, breadth is broadly, you define it, but how much of the market is is rallying? So if every stock is going up in a bull market, that is a very wide participation, a lot of breadth, wide breadth. Uh, now where it's the, you know, S&P 500, the Magnificent Seven, and it's the S&P, four, the other 493 companies in the S&P are somewhat you know, flat on the year it's fair to say that's narrow breadth. And you're saying there's a correlation between the sell-off and rates, rates going higher and uh, bond yields going higher and narrow breadth. Exactly. And the way, I, the way we are looking at breadth, to be very specific, is the percentage of stocks in the S&P 500 that are above their 200-day moving average. And so rates tick higher and that percentage goes lower. And it's been a very, uh, it t they're tied at the hip, really. That's a, it's been a strong correlation between the, a negative correlation between breadth and yields. And what that really does is it hollows out the market structure underneath the stock market. So really, it become puts more and more pressure on these mega cap tech stocks. And now we're going through the earnings season, and essentially these these stocks that have been carrying the market. You know, they're great companies. No one wants to deny that. They have great balance sheets. Everyone knows the positives. But when they come out, they beat on bottom line. They beat on top line. They The guidance has been pretty good. I mean, everyone's trying to pick nits on these specific earnings announcements now. But the bottom line is these have been strong earnings announcements, more or less across the board. In most of the stocks, I can't hold any gains and are actually being punished. And this is a very alarming sign if you're a stock investor, in my mind. It goes back to really the first time we saw this was in Q2 with NVIDIA. So a uh, partner of mine at 314 Research, Fernando, laid out his case for why he thought NVIDIA was really priced to perfection. He made that public before that earnings announcement. NVIDIA blew all of the numbers out of the water, bottom line, top line guidance, and still couldn't hold on to those post-earnings gains. And I think that was really, what you could call that a news failure or, or whatever you want. But the bottom line is it tells us that the, 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 the best case scenario had already been priced in to those stocks. And, and, uh, and, and so there was nothing left. There was no other buyers left. And so we're seeing that as we come through this earnings season with breadth already down because of the rates issue, it really makes the stock market, it puts them to the stock market in a precarious position. And so that's, uh, that's really the stock side. Bond side, we've looked at you know, bonds were overvalued and they're no longer overvalued. Look at nominal GDP. Our nominal G GDP model says the 10 year should be at about 5.1%. Here we are just a hair under that. If you think about where does the, how does the 10 year relate to the Fed funds rate? Historically, the 10 year settles out about 120 basis points above the Fed funds rate. And so, and that's in a, a normalized Fed funds rate. The, it, this gets, it puts a lot on the table and we can dissect it. But the bottom line is the Fed dot plot says that the terminal rate where they're going to end, where rates are going to settle is two and a half percent. And so I think that's a low. I think that'll come up. So we've put that at 3%, assume a 3% terminal rate, and then go back to that 120 basis point spread that exists usually between the 10 year and the Fed funds rate. That puts fair value 
for the 10 years, somewhere around four and a quarter. So you say nominal GDP, it looks a little bit expensive, the 10 year um, versus Fed funds rate and, and what we think terminal rates are going to be might look a little cheap. So all in all, it's fair value on the on the 10 year. Today's interview is brought to you by MetaMask Portfolio, your one-stop shop to manage your crypto assets and access a range of Web3 services all in one place. Overseeing your crypto assets across different wallets and networks can be very complicated. MetaMask Portfolio solves this by giving you the reins to manage your crypto from a single decentralized application or dApp. Just connect to MetaMask Portfolio to get a bird's eye view of all your coins, tokens, and NFTs, and you can easily buy, sell, swap, bridge, and stake crypto assets at competitive rates right within the app from a vetted list of providers. No more jumping between dozens of sites and apps. MetaMask Portfolio lets you do more in Web3 your way, giving you secure and convenient access to a wide range of features and services all in one place. Manage your portfolio your way with MetaMask Portfolio. Click the link in the description of today's episode to get started. Thanks, let's get back to the interview. We're going to have a recession and bond yields are going to you know, rally, bond prices are going to go to the moon. That call, which has aged so horrifically over the past 18 months, you are not in that camp. I mean, obviously, you know you you have not been in that camp. You're, but you're you're still not there yet. You're just saying the risk reward for bonds is getting more attractive. We're approaching fair value. We could be there already. And relative to other assets, the long term return profile is you know uh, more attractive. I want to get more into fixed income with you later, Warren. But just sticking with the stocks point. So, tell us about the earnings expectations that have gone along the S and P 500 as the stock market has rallied from its lows one year ago. And this really interesting point about the, the guidance that you make, you know, I'm anecdotally studying individual companies like Google had what I thought was a decent quarter. And, you know, their cloud growth was less than expected, but still 20%. And the stock sold off 9%. So that really reflects your point about how, you know, some of these stocks and the stock market broadly could be price per perfection, but that's just one company. Give us the macro data about the S&P 500 earnings estimates and how that plays into things. Because I think I have a chart from you, but it's, I think, from uh, September. So can you, can you update that from us just on the, the S&P 500 sort of next fiscal year estimates? Yeah, we, we think our view is that around the middle of each year, the S&P 500 starts trading off the next year's earnings estimates. And so that's where we start baking. We take those numbers and bake them into our valuation work. And it, it, it's been a while since forward uh, earnings estimates have actually risen. And, you know, if you go back all through last year and actually through the beginning of this year, they were basically down to flat at best. And finally coming out of Q2 earnings season, we've seen a small uptick in 2024 earnings estimates. And most of that's on the back of, uh, of margins. So, you know, that to me, that should be all net net. That's a, a bullish sign. It's, it tells us that there's, some uh, fundamental reason for the stock uh, rally that we saw lean in the Q2 earnings. But when you dig into the, the earnings season and how stocks reacted, going back to it, I think the most important uh, data point coming out of any earnings season is not any specific line item, cloud growth, anything like that. It's how does the stock react relative to what the expectations were heading into that earnings announcement. And when we went to Q2, the most alarming thing to us was there were a lot of stocks acting like we saw from NVIDIA, where they rallied into that quarter, they beat estimates. And the stocks that beat estimates, though, they fell in the same proportion to the stocks that missed estimates. So it tells us that the, even though we had some, yes, there were some positive earnings by, by going into 2024, it wasn't enough. The market had gotten ahead of itself. And so we, we, that was something that we that flagged for us and why we didn't get more up, uh, we didn't upgrade equities at all during uh, Q3, during Q2 reporting season. And it's something we really wanted to watch coming into this earnings season. And it's really come through in a bearish way is what we've seen is that these big cap stocks have not been able to hold gains despite beating earnings estimates, despite raising guidance. And despite beating on the top line, it's not just uh, it's not just um, pure margin growth, which is what really the forward earnings estimates had pointed to. So the fact that all those fundamental data points come through and yet these stocks are are falling apart is a is a real troubling thing. The stats for Q2, the only stocks that rallied were the if you could if you really separated the universe, were the stocks that were the guidance didn't just 
increase a little bit, it increased the most, like the highest decile of, uh, of guiders within the S and P 500. And then the other factor that helped were lower PE stocks. So stocks that were already kind of cheap going into earnings season actually did better coming out, but it was something like 75% of stocks, uh, sold off after earnings last, last, uh, in Q2 season and we're trending in a similar direction here for Q3. So this year, earnings expectations for 2024 were going down for the first half of the year, but wasn't true that earnings expectations for 2023 were going up? And if they weren't, how come the stocks have rallied so much this year? 2023 earnings estimates were stabilizing more or less, but in 2024, and why were they going up? That's a good question. I mean, it was multiple expansion mainly. Um, yeah, that was, that was part of the reason with the stock market is we saw, uh, uh, really it was, it, it was mostly multiple expansion during the big summer rally. We saw some earnings, some positive earnings revision, but it was much more multiple expansion. And then when you look at what the earnings, uh, growth was really coming from margin expansion, it was 80% margin expansion is from what we saw. So when, it, when you back it all out. The market was making a really big bet on margins uh, widening to record levels in 2024. Uh, we never really found that to be uh, a, a bet we wanted to make. It was, it was unconvincing to us. So, if you can explain the rally this year by looking at earnings expectations, it's not so much that they went up so much, but that they stopped going down. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that was a big. So it, it, one of the things, if you go back to 2022, when we were asking ourselves, one of the big things we've been trying to, to triangulate is, was that October bottom, the bottom? And we've spent a lot of time because so much has happened since then that doesn't happen in a typical stock market bottom in the year following a typical stock market bottom. But one thing that we needed to see was forward estimates rise. So we did, we were able to check that box at least, um, a little bit here. So that's why it was, it was important for us. I think important it was an important signal to market participants to see, okay, we are, there is some kind of cyclical upturn in earnings coming next year. And uh, whether you believe that's possible or not, and it aligns with your macro view is another thing, but at the very least, the analysts were baking that in to stocks. So what does it mean when companies are really performing quite well on earnings, but they, they sell off? How, is that kind of the polar opposite view of you know late March and April 2020 when the earnings were a disaster, but the stocks were rallying like crazy because you know stocks, equity markets are forward pricing mechanisms. What are equity prices now? Are they finally pricing in the recession that the bond market has been incorrectly predicting and economists have been in incorrectly predicting for so long now? To answer your first question, yeah, when it is the polar opposite of what happened in March, April 2020, it's it, when you see awful earnings reports and poor guidance in all of the bearish boxes checked, and yet stock prices firm and rally, that's a classically bullish sign. It's a, whatever you want to call it, I've heard uh, Jason Shapiro call it a news failure. It's, it, it's when you yeah. get a piece of news that goes one way, and then your asset that you're watching moves the other way. It's a key tell for markets that something that the trend is changing. Then on the other hand, what we're seeing right now is what I would call a bearish news failure. So. We've had really positive earnings for these big cap tech stocks. We saw this in NVIDIA last quarter too. And at the same time, the uh, stock prices can't hold gains. And so this is a really, this is a very bearish development. And then when you couple that with the market structure, knowing that the rest of the market is already in a pretty significant downtrend, Russell 2000 below its 2022 lows, rest S&P 493, an equal weight S&P down on the year. Uh, it's, a, it's a really dicey situation to have these big cap tech stocks going th reacting this poorly to ostensibly positive news coming into year end. I, I don't think it, 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 it makes a Q4 stand on rally, whatever, much less likely. And that is the big cap tech stocks. And you know, obviously, a lot of the fate of the tech stocks to some degree is the, is the fate of the entire stock market. I've been, you know, fo focusing a lot on banks and regional banks, and you know, it shouldn't surprise viewers. I've talked to some pretty bearish folks on banks and regional banks over the past six months. So I had, I guess, somewhat 
bearish expectations. The earnings of the banks and regional banks to some degree have exceeded my very bearish expectations, but the stocks have actually collapsed. So you're seeing the, the same thing going on in banks, even as credit, which is a lagging indicator, has, has performed better. Warren, tell us more about the market cap relation between uh, small cap stocks and how they're responding to interest rates. Uh, you've got some great charts just showing how it is quite a historic sell-off in small cap stocks, looking at the, the Russell 2000, as well as how the beta, the correlation to the 10-year treasury is much higher for the mid cap and small cap stocks. You know, when people say, oh, Apple is act interest rates are actually good for Apple because they have so much cash and because, uh, you know, they term their debt out to, to 2050. That's not really true for a lot of small cap stocks and nano cap stocks, is it? That's correct. There is a the, the maturity wall that everyone's talking about is much closer when it comes to small caps, mid caps um, in, in, in that segment of the market. So I, so there's a couple of things going on here. Number one, let's think about the sensitivities that's at the table there. So Russell 2000 has a much higher negative sensitivity to rising interest rates into interest rates than the s p 500 and then you can kind of say from the beyond that the equal weighted s p 500 is has a little bit is somewhere in the middle and mid caps is somewhere in the middle so you kind of see the sensitivity to interest rates travels through market cap size and the size of the index the way the index is constructed um i think that's for in in the, the one other thing about that is you're also seeing that the moves when when interest rates rise, the move on the downside for those indices is more dramatic. It's skewed negative than when interest rates fall. So you're seeing this kind of distribution pattern emerge, where even if if rates just chop around on days when they're up, there's a bigger fall and bigger downside response than when they fall upside response. So that's kind of how when we just forensically study market relationship, what we're seeing right now, uh, as far as rate sensitivity. I think there are two reasons for that. First, like we said, there's all of these stocks outside of the Magnificent Seven, there's an operational reason for the, the for the, the, this uh, relationship. They must access capital markets and they, they're going to have to roll their debt at some point in the next couple few years, depending on each stock and how they're sized and positioned. There are only about really when we all learned this during COVID, there might be five stocks globally that can survive if you shut the capital markets down indefinitely. Uh, but outside of that, these stocks, the rest of the universe, small caps, especially, they're reliant on capital markets for in, in debt markets for financing. And these rates are a real, they, they blow up business models across the board. So there's a good reason for, for this relationship when it comes to small caps. Uh, and so then we've had a lot of kind of, I'd say the second reason is valuations and nothing's immune to the valuation argument. Uh, when rates rise, as we said, you know, risk premiums, uh, equity risk premium collapses. Uh, earnings have not, forward earnings have not risen enough to offset the rise in interest rates in, from a valuation perspective for stocks. And even these mega cap stocks that in some ways do benefit because they have a big cash hoard on their balance sheet. Even these mega cap stocks, they're not immune to this. They're, they're, they're going to get caught up in this valuation thing. I, I, if I had to guess what's going on with these reactions to earnings, I think we've had a lot of investors hide out in these stocks for the operational reasons that they're immune to interest rates. And they're now starting to realize that there's also a valuation headwind that comes from higher interest rates. Um, the third thing that's going to happen over a long enough time frame is the flows problem. So you'll have these investors like pension funds and structural asset allocators who make this incremental move. If you look at household equity holdings, pension equity holdings, they're on a multi-decade uh, high level relative to bonds. With the 10-year at 5% and above, you're going to get a rotation out of those pools of capital from stocks to bonds. And so operationally, yes, the mega caps are immune to higher interest rates to a certain extent. But it, the valuation side and the flow side, they're not a move. As you, as you pointed out, the smaller cap stocks have been selling off as yields have risen. So now the narrative is, oh, the large cap stocks, they're, they're immune because the large cap stocks and like tech stocks have rallied. But you, you and I both know that two years ago, three years ago, the companies that would hurt from rising rates were Apple and you know the, the overpriced tech stocks. 
And the value stocks like the banks would do well because big banks, you know, benefit from from rising rates. So, you know, it just goes to show that you, you can't uh, believe everything everything that you hear. Tell us how you're thinking about the economy and re- recession. I know you've been doing a lot of very rigorous quantitative work on the housing market and how that can be a catalyst for a recession. Why do you think the U.S. economy hasn't had a recession so far? And are you in the recession camp now, or are you only dipping your toe in that in that pond? Anyone who's predicted a recession has had uh, been burned, and so it's a tough call to make. But just following our models and the way things work historically, uh, I do believe that recession is more probable than than usual. In, in, in our models, point towards middle of next year as when you would be on, I think, peak recession watch. And the way we we do that is we, we look at the housing market. I think our view is that the housing market is very central to the recession call to the U.S. economy, to U.S. consumer behavior. Um, in every major modern recession has been led by declines in residential construction payrolls. So housing, construction, payrolls. And we really see about an 8 to 10% decline in those payrolls before the economy rolls in recession. So we're trying to find something that leads the economy, and, it, and that leads us to this, the housing market, and specifically to jobs within the housing market. So if that's your framework, that is our framework, you start modeling out what's happening to the housing market, and what it, when are we likely to hit that 8 to 10% threshold. And we're down from we housing payrolls, housing construction payrolls peaked in January, and we have trended lower. Uh, so I think that is uh, now we've had the last last payroll report. It's hard to sugarcoat it. That was actually a a head scratcher, and it, it showed some job additions across the board. And the negative revisions is another thing we've been watching. We got positive revisions last time, and so there it's not a straight line. This data, and you have to have a framework more than a projection that works. And our framework says, let's look at what's happening with the housing economy. Let's look at what's happening with residential construction jobs and work backwards from there to, to figure out when a recession is most probable. And that points to, let's call it Q2 of 2024 at this point in time. Um, and why has that, why has that call been delayed and why has the economy held in so well? I think it's, it goes back to some really well documented reasons. The fiscal uh, fiscal policy has kept the market much stronger or the economy much stronger than um, we've ever seen. The pro-cyclical deficits, never seen 8.5% deficit as, uh, as a percentage of GDP. At the same time, unemployment's below 4%. Uh, these are, we are off the map. These are uncharted territory for us and, and for the economy. And so it's, it's very, um, it's, a, it's uncertain times, but it, 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 we're pretty confident that at 8%, the things that have carried the housing market forward, mortgage rates at 8%, those things stop around that point. You can't get the buy-down math that's worked for these builders and, and other factors that have allowed this housing market to stabilize are starting to kind of melt away at this level of interest rates. And so I think it's a, now a matter of time. I just want to flag again that when you say recession could be a Q2 2024, you are not uh, among the crowd of economists who have been, you know, expecting a recession for for close to two years. And then all, you know, every quarter you move the recession date back a quarter. This is a, fre- you're fresh. This is a fresh call. I also want to flag the pro-cyclicality fiscal deficits. Let's put a pin in that. We'll, we'll get in that later. You've, you've done some work that's really interesting to me on, on the plumbing front. But when it, let's talk about residential construction payroll, the job market. As everyone knows, the labor market is lagging. Is it it's fair to say though that the residential construction labor market is much less lagging than the overall labor market. So it is a leading uh, indicator for for the overall labor market. And you know, I'm just looking at a chart now that that we can put up on screen from you and, and th- the 314 team showing that actually the payroll numbers start to decline well in advance often of a, a recession, except for 2020, because that was just such a, a crazy shock. But are they are they declining now or they just stopped going up? What are you, what are you seeing now? And when looking, you know, going back in your back test, you say, oh, okay, they stopped going up in 2006. And then 2008, you know, we had a recession two, two years later. Where does that put us on the time horizon? Where do you get that call of the recession may start in Q2 2024? Also, is that everyone will know we're in a recession or that will be the official start date of the MBER that will likely be declared many months, if not even you know, a year later? 
Yeah, that would be the official start date. And that on average is six to 12 months after the recession start is when they declare it. So if everything went according to historic script, then you enter a recession sometime in Q2 of next year. And then uh, the NBER tells you that officially somewhere between the very end of next year and the beginning of 2025. So that's the amount of time we're talking about before you actually know if these calls pay off. And so you have to wonder, sometimes you wonder if there's how much utility there is, but I do believe this is a cycle where, you know, having a view on recession makes, um, is going to make a difference. Um, the, the, what we look at to give you the timing more precisely is eight to 10% drawdown in residential construction payroll. Once you hit that level, that's basically where the NBER paints the recession line historically. And so what goes into recession, residential construction payrolls, uh, ultimately your un houses under construction, units under construction feed that number. Because as long as you have a backlog of units to be built, then there are gonna be workers doing the, the building. And so we work backwards to figure out uh, when that backlog is going to decline to a place that predicts that residential construction payrolls will continue collapsing. So we've we've seen that number peak and start to come down. Multifamily has been one si part of the cycle that's hung in here. Uh, multifamily takes much longer to complete as a project, and it's been ongoing here. But we've recently seen one of the big uh, pieces of data that came through that we put a pin in was multifamily starts falling. Um, by a, a crazy amount here two months ago. And so it, and to me, that's people say, what's breaking in the economy? Well, I think multifamily is breaking. That's one of the things that's a, it's a, that is monetary tightening showing up. There's a lot of the fiscal dominant stuff. I know you've talked about, talked to folks about it. There are some, some people who believe that the Fed's powerless to tighten. Well, you can see it in the housing market. You can see it in the multifamily lending. You can see it in multifamily starts. And so that's, that's a big part of it is like, we're seeing starts fall, we're seeing multifamily starts fall, and that flows into the units under construction. And eventually it's just a matter of time before that flows into the housing jobs. And so that's the chain of causation that we're watching. And like I said, instead of having a, a point in time that we're just gonna get married to, we wanna have a flexible framework that takes in this data. And I know that's less exciting than saying, aha, I know this is when the recession is gonna come. But there is no other way to navigate a late cycle macro environment than to have your framework take in the data and adjust as that data comes in. And so uh, our chosen framework is definitely the housing market. You know, for our audience, multifamily is mostly apartment buildings. Single family is just, just houses. So the leading indicators for the residential construction are housing starts for multi, which you said are, are down as well as single family, so just you know, re regular houses. Tell us why has the strength in the single family housing market been so strong in the face of, of high mortgage rates? Uh, and of course, you know, we're talking about when people say home builders, they're talking about single family home builders. And then you know, which has a bigger economic sensitivity, multifamily, commercial real estate, uh, a bigger topic, or, or the single family home builders? And also you, earlier you said buy downs are down. What do you mean about buy down? Single family has held in mostly because if you think about single family home market, public builders who their stock's been on fire. So you think about Lennar, Pulte, uh, DR Horton, those, they make 50, they, they produce 50% of single family homes in the United States, publicly traded builders. Uh, they are able, they finance those, those houses themselves there. And, and so they're, they're able to buy down the rates. That's been a big factor. So they're able to, it's ultimately just an incentive you can see this in builder margins. And this is why we think that as mortgage rates hit 8%, that's where uh, you, the, the margin that's available for these builders to buy down those rates, it, becomes, it gets impacted. If you listen to the calls, the builders say, okay, this is where we're going to start um, backing down on activity. Uh, a lot of things happen around this 8% mortgage rate. Sorry, Warren. So, so people say eight uh, percent is going to slow down the housing market, or seven percent mortgage rate is going to slow down the uh, housing market. To the extent that it hasn't, it's because home builders are eating the loss. They're saying, "Oh, we'll give you a four percent mortgage, or we'll, you know, we'll take the hit of the spread between the eight percent and the four percent." As well as the fact that the existing home market is the volumes are down because everyone wants who has a low mortgage is going to stay 
stay in, in their homes, but the buy downs are unsustainable. They're unsustainable. So there, it's ultimately just a, it's there is no difference in a mortgage buy down, economically speaking, to a to a builder when you really just strip it away from just discounting the price of the house. Yes, it, it's just an incentive, and it's how you structure that incentive and gets people in into houses. Um, uh, and they've they've done other things. They've pulled other levers, like making houses smaller and a little cheaper, and they can do that up to a certain point. But I do believe that from our analysis, that eight percent is about where you run out of uh, runway for these big publicly traded builders. And I think that's why you've seen their stocks really their stocks have ran through the year, and then mortgage rates cross into this kind of upper severance, lower eights level nationally, and they've been, been murdered. And so to me, I, I think the market's telling us that we're our analysis is correct here. Like you said, the other things that have, have held single family up at this point in time is the um, the the golden handcuffs of low mortgage rates have kept everyone in. And people know this by this point in time. This existing family, the existing home market is totally locked up. And so that has been a, a, a major factor. We've had the, the, the buy downs. Uh, and so to me, this is uh, this is a really a, a market that's shown resilience, and there has been mistaken for reacceleration, and it's really just a, a, t- a matter of time and resilience. As far as what segment of the market is most um, economically meaningful, the way we look at it again, housing jobs, and a single family unit employs about three times as many people as a multifamily unit, and so that's where why is that. Uh, if you think about a multifamily unit, it's a building with boxes in the sky, more or less, right? And so it's uh, they're, they're generally smaller. So it, you, know, you might have more units as far as a number is concerned, but there are less workers per unit. And that's how the, dot, the data comes in. And so single family home is, you know, your typical, whatever, 2,700 square foot house, I think is the average right now. And Three, three bedrooms, two bathrooms, garage, all that stuff. So it's it's about three x the number of workers to build uh, and complete a single family unit. And so that's where, in our view, if you gave us one number, what's the most important single family starts is really that most important leading number for this whole funnel that we've created going into recession. Um, and they've they've gone from a hundred thousand per month to about seventy thousand per month over the last year. So you know that's. Um, that is not a market that's reaccelerating, uh, and as these rates go up here, I think you're going to see single family. And if we're and if it, they don't, then we're going to be wrong about a recession call. We're going to see single family starts fall uh, even more. I think that on top of economically sensitive, it's how much has a part of an economy how is that doing, and then how much is that representative of the broader economy or how many people are employed. And the perfect example is the existing home market has a complete freeze. So it is a very tough job market for you know realtors, mortgage agents, that that type of labor market. But in terms of what really drives labor growth, and I learned this recently, it is that construction. So if the construction is still going on, even if the transactions in the existing home market aren't there, the labor market can still still be strong. So I'm looking at single family uh, starts as well as single family under construction. So single family under construction has gone down since early 2022. How is it that employment has been robust as, as the construction has gone down? Well, the, the, this gets really complicated, but the, the bottom line is, is the market, the, the labor market has been exceedingly tight. I mean, it's been, for the first off, you know, we, we really skip over it whenever we have these conversations, but if you go back, I, I mean, we've underbuilt it, houses in this, this economy really back since the GFC. And now you have demographically, you have a, a huge a bulge of 35 to 44 year olds, the millennials basically coming into, if they're not going to buy a house now, then when, you know, this is their prime home buying years to, you know, where they want to start a family and all those things that come with them, that, that life cycle. Um, and so the market starts from a very tight perspective. And then we had reduced um, immigration for many years in the, during really the Trump administration. And so the labor market for construction has been so tight and coming into this that we can, you can run a regression, which we have a little model that shows how many units are being built, the mix of units between multifamily and single family, and what's the expected number of employees based on that mix of units under construction. And 
really for up until recently, it tells us that there are fewer employees than we would expect given the housing activity that we have in this country. And that's just another way of saying this is a tight labor market. So the first stage of this decline has just been to loosen that employment. So we've, we went from really tight to loose to we are seeing the first stages of residential construction job losses. And that's just, it's a long process. It doesn't happen overnight. And, and those are the factors that are kind of holding it up and keeping it uh, from moving quickly. So, and then looking at the general labor market, the level of jobs that we're adding now, which is you know in the, the few hundred thousands, where do, would that put us with regard to previous recessions? Because I, I would say it's exceptionally unlikely that, for example, we're in a recession now or that a recession starts in, in December. Because you know, I mean, you're you're a professional data analyst, but I, I just put together my own little little you know Excel spreadsheet, and it, it shows that like if a recession were to start in Q4 of this year, it would be the only recession in history where the the U.S. was adding this many jobs per month, you know, two months before. Yeah, we're not in a recession right now. I've had that debate with people like uh, we we did, we, and we have that our scatter plot of looking at or our um our what we call an event study where we look at how do overall total non-farm payrolls react going into a recession and through the beginning parts of the recession. And in the pattern we've seen over the last year, it looks nothing like any recession we've ever seen. So it would, I think it's really difficult to make an intellectually honest argument that um, we're in a recession right now or that we've been through one or anything like that. So I totally agree with you. And this is, a, if anything, I would say Mike, our call is going to be too soon. You know, the last payroll report was strong. We just came through a Q3 GDP report that was showing the economy growing at like 5%. So the economy is robust, but there's a path dependency. Like all these things when you're making a big, when you're making a prediction on uh, economy or complex systems like this, there is path dependency. And one of those things is asset prices. So we've seen a 10% decline in the stock market now. We've seen bond prices uh, as yields go up, bond prices going down. We're seeing house prices start to soften, given the dynamics we just talked about. This wealth effect is real, and it it, it's, it will impact consumer behavior going forward. Uh, and and so I, I think that uh, when you pat, when you go forward, it, it's we're definitely not in a recession right now. But just because we've seen job growth in the last say nine or 10 months that's uh, that's non-recessionary doesn't mean that the call going into Q2 uh, is invalidated. Uh, in fact, we did a study, we looked at, you know, blockbuster retail sales and blockbuster um, housing numbers in the year before recession. And you actually have quite a few of them historically. So growing the economy by 300,000 jobs in the, in a month, in one of the months before a uh, recession is, is totally normal actually. Okay, but what about the acceleration? Like the the three month, uh, an average of the of the monthly payroll advances. Haven't we seen an an increase? Wouldn't that increase from like two hundred thousand to three hundred thousand be somewhat anomalous? Not for recession in Q Q two next year. I'm saying for like Q four this year. Oh yeah, for right now, I don't think I'm not making any. I'm definitely not trying to make an argument that any of the data we've seen right now it indicates we're in a recession or going to have a recession before the end of this year. I don't think that's a. a I don't think that you can make that argument. So I agree with you. But but all I'm saying is that looking out, say, eight or 12 months from now, just because we had a strong payrolls report last uh, report doesn't invalidate this forward recession idea. So Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. All right. We agree that the U.S. economy has defied the you know near consensus re- recession expectations of, of a year ago. But are the folks who, who take that and they, do they take it too far when they say, the economy is reaccelerating from a trough of last year. And that there's some superficial data to suggest that, for example, real GDP advanced for Q3, quarter over quarter, inflation adjusted, 5%. So if we have 5% growth, and then you know inflation's at what, you know, 4% or somewhere around there, that's 9% growth. Clearly, that's uh, not only not a recession, that, that, that is a boom. You're asking whether the, um, the we're reaccelerating here is basically... I mean, if you take that at face value, there is some kind of reacceleration going on. Uh, I mean, that's just, that's, there, it's kind of undeniable that there is. I don't think that it's going to be sustainable. Q4 already looks pretty weak, uh, relatively speaking. So uh, GDP growth, I think that 
the consensus estimate for GDP growth in Q4 is just over 1%. So there's a pretty big reversion back here coming uh, ahead of us. And uh, I, if I had to guess why did we have the recession already or was the slowdown in 2022 and are we on the other side? Uh, that's been something we've looked at from a lot of different angles. And I would say, no, I don't think that we have. I don't think you know, if you, if it, if it was, you know, if we've looked at soft landings and how do soft landings occur. The one thing that we had was the decline in oil prices has been a tailwind. That's, that's true. We've had fiscal tailwinds. That's also true, but monetary policy, the movements of the yield curve, loan growth, CNI loan growth, the leadership within the stock market, um, None of these things point to 2022 being a a you know a, a real cyclical bottom. On you know that, that I'm, does that mean the stock market is going to make new lows? Maybe I don't know, but it, this is it doesn't look this isn't totally off the script that you would expect if 2022 was the recession or the soft landing that that we're we're going to have and the cycle's over. I think I still think the trough is in front of us, honestly. And when you say that it's unarguable that to to some degree there has been a reacceleration growth, what are you talking about? Are you talking about in real terms? And in in that case, it would be maybe just the fall in inflation, which really is you know a lot of it is the fall in oil. What do you what do you mean there? I, you, in order to answer the question properly, you have to go back to to the twenty twenty two bottom and say, okay, what really happened off of that low? Why did we see things like retail sales spike and payroll spike coming into this year? Um, cause if you remember, we had that blockbuster retail sales number early this year and everyone was like scratching their heads and then we had the AI craze and things like that. So really what happened in my mind was we had the fed jack short-term interest rates back at the end of last year. And then we had, of course, by now everyone knows Yellen make the decision to fund the, the treasury by issuing bills and not notes and, or, or, or bonds. Then we had the debt ceiling, which in caused the the treasury to spin down the TGA. So this was a stealth sim- stimulus because in fact, when the Fed's hiking short-term rates, but the back end of the curve is being held down by all these factors, you have what I think is this perverse stimulative environment for this economy because you're stimulating through the income channel. So all the rich people with money in their money markets funds are getting income growth through the higher rates, the Fed funds rate and the reverse repo and things like that, that are, that are flowing into that part of the economy. The borrowing channels being stimulated because the longer term, five years and out, those rates were falling back then. So to me, that was the the core of the stimulus that caused this May relic reacceleration in the economy coming off the end of last year. You couple that with the fact that oil prices went da- continued to go down. So China's slow to open economy earlier in the year kind of was a tailwind for, for us. They were exporting that deflation away. Um, and so those are two factors uh, that that really helped the economy. I think interest rates were held down due to the lack of supply in the first half of the year, and uh, oil prices were artificially low due to China being uh, slow to really reopen like people had expected. And so those two things were kind of stealth stimulus for the economy, and that's all uh, behind us at this point in time. And what's your current outlook on oil? You've been bullish for a few months, which has worked out well. But why is that? Has that been fundamental reasons or more on a technical basis of all the the hedge funds being short? So what are your general thoughts on oil now? Why you sort of like oil or oil stocks as a a hedge? What do we think about oil here? Our our model is neutral. We were long from beginning of July to middle of September. And that was from like low 70s to upper 90s. I think that the Saudis wanted to, they've accomplished largely their goal, which was to teach the the short sellers a lesson here. So that the speculators had been betting on this recession we're talking about. They had got short oil to express this bet. The Saudis were like, no, we're not going to let this fly. So they made OPEC and Saudi in particular withheld a ton of oil from the market. They're still holding this mar- oil off the market and they've created these kind of artificial deficits, which eventually the data forced these hedge funds to cover their positions and drive the price up. But I think that trade is lar- largely over at this point in time. Um, and so the next thing you have to start wondering about is how does the oil that's been held off the market get back into the market? So it's kind of a bearish 
dynamic now. We went from a bullish dynamic to a bearish overhang at this point in time. So if I had to lean in a direction, I would be bearish. The other factor is when you come to this part of this part of the year for oil, it's a it's, it's a kind of a negative time seasonally. And there's reasons for that. You, you end up with Mexico doing their kind of infamous Hossie in the hedge where they go out into the market and start uh, buying uh, buying puts for all their, their oil production. So the banks and dealers are selling a bunch of puts at this point, which creates this kind of negative gamma impact. So if the price starts going down, they have to sell futures in order to offset that exposure. The um, And it creates this kind of seasonal uh, air pocket underneath the market. And when you do that, you combine that with the fact that hedge funds are are basically they got overextended short and then turned it that around by September they were overextended long so uh, the backdrop is kind of bearish for the, the the end of the year but then of course you have the geopolitical uh strife that's really come in and interrupted the cycle that we're in right now yeah so the hacienda hedge if, if folks can tell you you are an oil market veteran that's you know your your, your first and then you brought it out uh into into the macro oh so with hedge funds being short is it in, in the oil market, is that actually a real phenomenon? Unlike in the bond market where they're short a ton of bond futures against being long cash, cash positions to harvest a sort of a discount or a, a premium, in the oil market, are they actually making speculative positions? So in other words, they, do, they are directionally exposed. So when it, it, they, when it rallies, they have to cover? Absolutely. Yeah, it's, so it's, yeah it's, the, the bond market is a basis trade, and this is just an out, it's much more of an outright bet in the, the oil market. And if I had to look at one timing indicator in the oil market, it would be our futures, our hedge fund futures positioning. They're, we, they're hedge funds and CTAs. Within the CFTC, they call it the managed money group, which is really the fast money. Our strategy, we call it fade the CTAs. So when they get to extreme and you can kind of see the extreme, whether it's on the long side or the short side, you just want to go the other direction. And obviously, you need to have a view on fundamentals because it's just going to, that's going to supercharge whatever the fundamental backdrop is. Uh, and so, yes, it's it's not like the bond market. It's much more of a directional bet. You were overweight commodities. Now you're underweight commodities, which obviously excludes oil. So you're somewhat bearish on oil, although obviously there's a huge, you know, right tail risk of ge- geopolitical stuff. But you do like energy as a sector within the S&P as a hedge. Tell us why, as well as your thoughts on how oil and energy does going into a recession. The typical view is that, oh, when there's a recession, the price of oil is going to tank. It's not the very lead. We, we have and continue to recommend an overweight energy position. I think it's, it's a, within your equity sleeve, you need to be overweight the energy sector. So energy is like 5% S&P 500. I think you should at least double that in whatever your equity exposure is in this market. It's because energy is diversifying your portfolio and doing things that nothing else in the market is doing. It was through 2022, negatively correlated to every other sector in the market, negatively correlated to bonds. In we've seen that kind of reemerge in the second half of this year. And I could absolutely envision a scenario, especially with the geopolitical stuff going on around the world where oil spikes, everything sells off except for oil and energy. Uh, and you've, you're in this portfolio position where uh, you're looking, every, and, and again, unlike the years before where bonds and stocks move against each other, I do think that's going to be one big trade until we get closer to the recession. So for now, you're not going to get any kind of diversification benefit or very little from your bond portfolio. So it's it's really up to cash and things like energy to give you any kind of, um, to smooth out the volatility within your portfolio. So that's our that's the reason we like it. The going on to that, answering the question about how does energy perform going into recession really dovetails into that. Energy, despite what people think, holds up going into a recession quite well and actually leads the market going into most recessions, leads for a little bit into the recession. Um, and so it's a late cycle performer. And one of the interesting factors we've seen is we've split up you know, all the recession cases, all the soft landing cases uh, in modern times. And we look at how does energy perform going into your hard landings, your recessions and your soft landings. And energy does extremely well 
going into the hard landings, as I said. Sorry, it, we're, we're talking about the price of oil or energy stocks? Energy stocks here. Okay. And then energy underperforms the rest of the market going into soft landings. So it's a hard landing asset, not a soft landing asset. If you look at the rest of the market right now, even after the sell-off, I think the market's still priced more or less for a soft landing next year. Look at how earnings are priced. We have a 12% earnings growth in 2024, another 10% earnings growth year in 2025. A smooth line drift higher in earnings is a soft landing in my view. So the market's priced for a soft landing. You can you need to diversify by finding assets that outperform in a hard landing. And energy, I think, from our research, is one of the best candidates to outperform going into those hard landings and recessions. Wow. So I mean, I know, I know you've got the, the data to, to back it up, but that is really surprising to me because you know, I guess what the consensus is, or my perception of the consensus is that oil is a reflation trade. So when everything's going well and the economy is booming, there's a high demand for oil. And when you're in a recession, the uh, demand collapses and the price collapses. Why is that not the case? Can you give us sort of a peek behind the curtain into the data? Uh, as well as if we have a recession, I mean, you really think XLE is going to do better than uh, like a, a duration ETF like like TLT or something like that? Eventually, no. I mean, eventually the yeah, duration takes over. It's the matter of, it's that time leading into it. So where are we right now? We're late cycle. What comes next? A landing, a soft landing or a hard landing. That's what comes next in my view. And so if, uh, it, if the whole market's priced for a soft landing, you want to overweight those assets that are priced for the hard landing. And that's what I think is, is for energy. And so why is it that energy outperforms going into a recession? Well, part of the reason is if you look at, there's not that many recessions to cover. You and I, I think, talked about this beforehand. I've, I've heard you talk about this with a few guests, I believe. It's like you go back, it's 2020, it's COVID. It's 2007, 2008. It's 2001, 1991, which was the Gulf where you go back through the 80s and you have to go back into the early 80s and uh, late 70s for your next recession cases. So they're very rare events, but when you start studying them, because this is the only history we have to study, higher oil prices show up on the scene of the crime very often. So if you're gonna have one of these recessions, you usually end up with a little late cycle push from oil. Um, and, and there's, you can zoom in, there might be a reason here, a reason there, but that ultimately is a, it, it, it's a causative factor. So it's not like this outperformance in hard landings is totally unrelated or it, it, it's it's related. Oil higher oil prices generally tend to happen around these recessions, and that's good, obviously, for energy stocks. Soft landings, like I said, is the other factor. If you're going to get a soft landing, you need a few things. I think you need the Fed to be ready to cut interest rates fast. We call it a hyperreactive Fed, but you also need energy prices to stay cool, and that's that's why I think when you get into a soft landing, you see energy sector underperforming. Um, so yeah, it's it's not a random thing. Oil is a causative factor in the historic recession cases we have to study. I think what has confused me so often, and what you know, I often see conf confuses other people as well, is confusing something as a cause versus something as a consequence. And you know, there's oil, and then there's rates. People say high interest rates are contractionary. And they are, they, they constrain economic activity. At the same time, they are often the result of a boom. So a boom causes interest rates to go up, and then interest rates cause interest rates to go down. And say, wait, you know, a boom, when there's huge amounts of demand, causes the price of oil to go up and until it, it's too much, and then the, the, the demand is not there. It destroys demand. What level of oil prices, if we're you know, around you know, close to 90 to bucks for, for oil now, what level of oil will destroy demand? Because it destroyed demand last year at 120, but not enough to tip us into a recession. So do, you, do we need more than that to tip us into a recession? No, I don't think we need it. I think uh, under the surface, rates are higher. It, it, like you said, in the, the economy is further along, whether you want to look at that excess savings or savings in general. Uh, many of these factors that held the market up and held the economy up have been whittled away. So I don't think it's a matter of like, well, oils, there's a difference between saying oil can help push the economy into a recession and oil can flat out be the main cause of the recession. I'm not looking for that kind of a cycle here. And it could happen. Let's say we end up going to war with Iran or 
something like that. And, and you know, Iranian exports have really ramped here recently. It's been one of the things that's kind of helped um, keep the market balanced during this post-Ukraine uh, time period. And so let's say Iran gets pulled into this war and sanctions come down harder on them or the flow of oil from Iran stops, you could get a big spike. You could get a spike like we saw last year. And I think the economy is more vulnerable at this point in time and would not be able to survive that at this point in time. So 120 would do the trick at, at this point to me. 120 oil would, would do the uh, trick. For a final topic, Warren, let's talk about the pro-cyclical fiscal deficits. How extreme is the credit card that the U.S. government is running? Although, you know, unlike everyone else who has a credit card, the U.S. can print its own money. And just how ahistoric is it for... Or, or you know, not his work for um, unprecedented for the U.S. to be running such large deficits when the economy has been, uh, you know, not in a recession. And what are the causes of that deficit? The causes are all the stimulus that we spent, and is that's now coming through the system um, following COVID, and that, of course, interest rates is a huge factor as well. So you know, it's interest rates are about half of the of the deficit you could say right now uh the interest rate increase has been about half of the increase in the deficit the the stat i always say is we're at we're running a deficit of 8.5 percent of gdp right now and the unemployment rate is at three six three five right now whatever and you just it's totally anomalous there is usually a strong relationship where deficits blow out like this when the economy starts contracting, when unemployment rises and tax receipts fall. This is a totally different beast where we're running these kinds of recessionary deficits while the economy is at full employment and the tax receipts are theoretically at closer to a peak than a trough. So you, you, in another way to see this is the much talked about uh, bills versus coupon uh, issuance and funding that the Treasury and Secretary Yellen have decided to fund the government with. So usually, again, going back to how deficits usually expand during contractions, during those big deficit moments, that's when the, the government typically decides to fill the gap with a, a load of bill issuance. The bills market's much deeper, so they come to market and fill those deficits in with with bills. And so as a result, around these periods of high unemployment and low tax receipts, you see the percentage of bills outstanding of total debt pop up maybe into the mid 20s or or whatever. And the stated range for that for the for by the treasury for that number is between 15 and 20% of total debt outstanding should be bills. So when that happens, it's it's anomalous and they work to get it down. The thing we're seeing now is similar to we're seeing a huge deficit while unemployment is low. We're seeing a huge amount of bills outstanding. 22% of total debt is now bills outstanding while unemployment is low. And this is also anomalous. So we're running this deficit. We're funding it with short-term bills. And the economy is still at full employment. This is a pretty, I, I'd say this is a pretty dicey uh, backdrop. Because when, when tax receipts do roll over, when employment does start to fall off, it's only going to worsen the deficit. Now, yeah, we'll have some we should have some relief on the interest rate side at that point in time. But historically, the deficit blows out when you go into, into these situations and rates fall. I think there's no telling what happens this time around. It's, it's, uh, I'm short on conclusions, just able to point it out and say this is really um, – we're off. We're, we're in uncharted territory. We've never seen this before. I like that you're short on uh, conclusions. <laughs> well, I, I mean, it's all I can say is it. You don't end up usually with these deficits and this level of bills uh, issuance when the economy is at full employment. So, what happens when the economy is no longer at full employment and tax receipts are starting to roll over? Hard. You can do the math yourself. It's a, it, the, the, everything, all this math, all of the deficits and all these things we're talking about gets worse uh, and these problems compound. And normally in a recession, the deficits go up, which is stimulative for the private sector. You know, maybe they go up because people go on unemployment and that's an you know, uh, automatic stabilizer. 
and then the government funds that with bills, so short-term things. So, so the demand for duration is high because the economy is slowing down and entering or already in a recession. And the supply of duration does not go up that much because it's funding itself with bills. But what's going to happen now? That's, so, I mean, do you think it's possible that, I mean, some people go, and I don't know, I, I consider this somewhat extreme view that the U.S. enters a, a true recession, a full-blown recession, that no one argues it's not a recession, that bonds won't rally or could you know have a, a huge sell-off? Are you willing to go that far? Maybe a little bit, but I think the more logical place to go with the conclusion is that the, the Fed does step back into the bond market before this all is said and done. You know, I think that's probably more likely is that they restart QE um, it, at that point in time. And uh, the, the gap that's been left by the Fed that, you know, it's in, in that market, it, they come back and fill it. So to me, that that's probably the most logical conclusion um, for how this pay, plays out in a real um, true recessionary scenario. But I guess we'll find out. We will find out. So Warren, you were the second guest on Forward Guidance. Thanks so much for, for coming on and making it, you know, really contributing to the show at such an early stage. And I believe this this will be the 302nd episode. So we're 300 episodes later. Thank you so much for for coming on uh, for throughout this this journey. Tell us a little bit more about 314 Research and, and the work that you do. And if folks are, have been watching on, on YouTube or on, on Twitter, X, they'll have been able to see several of, of the charts that you, you make. Yeah, I, it's been awesome watching your show take off and just been, it was really an honor to be invited on so early. So cool to watch that happen. And uh, I really just think you should, I noticed you follow your curiosity. And to me, that's the, the key is uh, following your curiosity. If you do that, then you'll, you'll continuously learn. And that's what this is all about. Markets are all about that. As far as 314 goes, you can follow me at Warren Pies on Twitter or at 3F underscore research. That's the company Twitter handle. And then the company web- website, the number three, the spelling out 14 research.com and put your information in. We are in an institutional research provider, but um, so if you're an institution, get in touch with us and we'll send you some sample work and see if there's a fit. Thanks so much, Warren. And thanks everyone for watching. Thanks, Jack.